Hey up, no more vortex. Um, I'm slightly tighter than before. I lost the beard and I'm in a new place and moved to uh, moved somewhere else. So it's spotty actually. Horrible. Oh, well. uh, anyway, <laughs> that's not the point of this video. Uh, I'm going to be talking about my. I want to just read a few extracts from my work in progress. Um, my work in progress um, book, a second short stories collection. Working title of Romance in the Commie Blocks. So this collection is going to be short stories, a few little poems as well, but basically this short stories collection is... So my last, the theme of my last novel, uh, short stories collection, sorry, no more, is, was, um, it's called Suicide by Computation, and it was a lot about, like, oblivion and um, a sort of sadness and the destructive energy and the sort of fatality of the, the world sometimes the fatalistic view of the world you know the pessimistic extraordinaire um now this book so far of which i'll read a few extracts from is actually very very bipolar in a way actually, funnily enough. So there's very much a contrast of dark and light that's going to be the main theme i think in this in this collection of short stories is that is the um the tension between darkness and light within human beings really. Uh, I went into this, first thing I wanted to do was write a proper love story. And that story is in progress and I'm quite enjoying it. I read a little bit of that one, but not all of it obviously because it'll spoil the story. But uh, I'll, read, I'll read some bits of it basically. I'll start now. Uh, it's already, already two minutes in. So this is uh, Romance in the Comic Box. And I'll start with, the, the order isn't exactly um, you know, decided yet, but I can uh, first two bits so two poems from the uh, from the from the story collection okay let's go neon abstraction hums the hum of my ghost vibrates in neon abstractions in the distance I hear the melody grow as I enter which front the wires descend, plugging her in, as she looks at me, bewitched and sad. A cybernetic nest, an eternity, the light shines down in rainbow spectrum. So as the tesseracts and cubes above our heads, rotate in and out, swirling. We stare, see beyond. Realize the magic of technology, transcending into the dim neon lights of the Nephanet. That's the first poem, sort of sets the tone maybe for the story, is what I'm thinking. And then, uh, ah, Romance in the Comic Blocks, which is another poem which sort of sets the tone for the short stories collection. There is romance in the Comic Blocks. Cigarette stains on the walls, flowers in the windows, cockroaches crawling. All filth, beautifully human filth. Drunk men and empty women. True love and sweet kisses. Old ladies walking with airs of saints. There is romance in the commie blocks, it's true. Dancing drunk on the sidewalk, the fire outside the boarded up windows. Broken panes of glass, communist cubist collage. The dream came true, alas, no, how could it? I got, for those who could dream, found themselves buried deep in their concrete, thicker than lead, their own cosmos of imagination. And please take off your shoes. Romance isn't dead. It just goes on holiday to Russia. Under the warmth of a thick blanket, coiled, all embrace as the demovoy smiles and lights his pipe. So that's uh, two of the poems from it. There's a, there's a, there is another one I'm working on, but I don't want to go through all the poems, obviously, because then it, it'll just. Uh... And some of these I've already read, actually. So I've read the He's a Gorilla story. Um, so I've read The Boy Love the Dark, so I'll read a bit on separate videos, I'll read a bit of Inquisitor and the Rebel, which is 
a work in progress at the minute actually and it is actually the key, forms the key love story it's also the longest one so far so it's the most developed in terms of length for short story so this is the inquisitor and the rebel and it's not finished like i said it's a work in progress so don't expect it to be polished but i thought it'd be cool to read some of this out so titan amori's eyes glowed blue the glare from his monitor burning like some strange sun in his dark glasses as he finished off a long work performing data crunching and production level analysis of production levels in the data quadrant. Not exactly thrilling stuff, he thought to himself, but it pays my wages. And who couldn't be thankful at least that in a time such as these? Looking out of his window, he observed the scene below him as he stood up in his administration class government apartment. Green lights glowing and pulsating in the distance on the streets below. People milling and moving like fish pot rush hour. A uh, fish post rush hour. The insane rhythm of the city. Time for rest. Titan muttered to himself before shutting down his government issued interface. Severing his connection to the all seeing eye. The world was in chains, but the machinery was all they knew. You have no idea how wrong you are, Melanie, Brexton explained, his wild fuzzy afro bobbing about as he spoke in harsh tones, his bulbous eyes screaming, seeming to pop out of his skull, glaring intently at her through his thick rimmed glasses as he spoke in harsh tones, gesticulating towards her with spindly long arms. Melanie was sat in the corner of the cafe, frequenting her favourite cafe, the Doll Flame. She was a thin and feline-like woman with dark black hair and eyes that burned with the intensity of her anarchist convictions. The only route to change has to come from an international movement, a raising of consciousness, you see. Once the oppressed masses consciousness reaches that peak level, then we can take back the reins of power! Brexton continued his monologue. But, said Melanie, her voice raising slight with an initial tone of nervousness to this, how can we connect to the masses when they are so placated? Talk to your man on the street about your grand theories, Brexton, and I think you'll find the common man could care less about the abstractions, the endless mithering and factionalism. A new society must be founded on a common shared value and a yes, a radicalism. But not radicalism divorced from pragmatism, she snorted. You know, I like you, Brexton, but sometimes I think you wake radicalism as a sort of badge of honour. And it can get damn tiresome at times. Melody reeled up the lines as she took another sip of a half-finished beer. Brexton looked at her with his usual disengaged expression. There were shifting eyes betrayed a certain discomfort. Well, we're still comrades, Melanie, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But I think having these sort of debates is uh, exactly our strength. Not like the technocrats. The flattening of hierarchy is by its very nature a difficult and thought process. Well, comrade, on that, we can agree. Melanie nodded. The mechanical arm blared out its loud siren in Titan's sparse minimal flat, waking him up instantly from his slumber. He awoke with a jolt and proceeded to drag himself up from his bed sheets to his desk in his interface, his rock of Sisyphus, as he would refer to it. After a quick coffee, Titan switched on the copper mechanical interface with a switch on the side and listened to the comforting hum as it began to spring into life. A thousand mechanical gears and wires whirring and churning as the interface came to life once more. A grainy eye appeared on the monitor as it did um, every morning. The all-seeing eye of the overseer. Titan, give glory to our overseer and see to it that the work is done, muttered the machine in its melancholic melody of mechanization. The beady eye that knows all. Titan had to admit, though only ever in his private internal thoughts, 
that he was uncomfortable with the extent of the surveillance that the bureaucracy had imposed on the people after the Great Reformation, but he had an inbuilt trust in power and authority. He was a bureaucrat after all. And if there was one thing a bureaucrat knew, it's to trust the efficiency of the system. The monolith which constantly delivers. The source of knowledge and truth. He would play these mind games with himself, but he knew deep down that it was all necessary. For without the order of the overseer, chaos would once more reign in the hearts of men. Titan had seen what men were capable of when order was not the prevailing system. Still, to this day when he closed his eyes, he could remember the sight of the city in flames. The cathedral he had to run to to protect himself with his mother from the armies of counter-revolutionary forces that stormed throughout the great city. Things were not perfect, he thought, but they had been much worse in recent history. Better the devil you know than the dragon of chaos. The overseer was a wise man after all, and his cybernetic knowledge had granted him an elite few of the ability to at least make life better for most, if not all. Data crunching and cybernetic communism was their path, the golden path to a better tomorrow, and it was worth every sacrifice to make it a true reality. He knew he was an ideologue on some level. They had sacrificed themselves to the big idea, but he felt safe, calm even in the face of the world now. And it had given him a sense of meaning in his life. Titan pulled the lever in front of him to activate the data crunching and analysis and awaited his task for the day. So I'll leave it there, that's probably about uh, it's probably just under half of that one. I'm not going to go into the rest of it because, like I said, it's a work in progress and there'll be lots, tons of spoilers for the actual thing if I went further, obviously, but that's that. Okay, I'll read this one. This is quite short. This is quite a uh, uh, content warning. It has a lot of violence. It has subtext. It has sexual imagery. It has... This is a weird one. So this is like this is sort of like a combination of a horror, a sci-fi, and a satire, basically, in a in a... Piece of writing. It's called Flesh Arena 22, and uh, let's see what you think of this. Like I said, content warning, this is not for kids. The man and woman looked at each other in the dark, half darkness, naked, exposed in the dim neon light of the arena of the flesh. He trembled as he looked at the exposed breasts, his hand and semi erect penis, dreaming of rubbing himself all over her luxurious, shining, pert breasts, light bouncing from them in noir darkness. It was being broadcast on every channel to the animals outside, salivating at the images before them as they breathed heavily, desperate to see the day's sacrifice. Let the games begin! <laughs> Sorted the perverted plague prince from his throne made for the bones of long gone nuns and priests, his altar to naive virginity and purposeful impotence. The naked man laughed with an insane, loud, booming laugh which echoed throughout the arena. <laughs> the woman exposed the elements, cowered in fear as she heard it, witnessing the beast before salivating like a wolf ready for the kill, drooling like some creature of the raw, unconscious id. Before you strike, obeying insane wolf, at least let us talk a little first, she protested. The prying, perverted eyes rolled within their monitors as a collective groan echoed throughout the chambers of the arena. We want action. We want fucking. We want death. We want spectacle. We want violence, rape, destruction and chaos and lots of it. They bleated like dead, broken, monotone calculators. The man looked around. His face stuck in a grimace as they encircled each other. He snarled and stared at the woman intensely, growling and getting ready to pounce as she observed him like a hawk ready to strike upon his prey. Her eyes darted, guided to his direction as they spiraled around each other in a lament of lust and violent potential. The audience cheered as the ceremony began. The spectacle would unfold soon. The tragedy and the steaming vent for their dead, dull lives below chained to energy reactors. These beings were no more than humanoid batteries, paralysed, gluttonous husks, plugged into a reactor core, coils and wires stuck into every orifice, feeding the giant machine of which this perverse arena was just one single element of debauchery and a maze of impure insanity. 
Then the wolf pounced with a terrible, terrible howl, striking her in the face, blood pouring from her eyes as he struck with his exposed large hairy paw, dealing in bloodlust as a wolf does, screaming in the blood red room. She grimaced and stepped backwards a little bit, but remained firm in her place. The batteries cheered and whooped with delight digitally, seeing the horror unfold before them, giving them at least some semblance of meaning in this cold, dead, clockwork, mechanical world. So that's that one. And then uh, finally, I'll read the thousand yard stare, which is, I'm pretty happy with this actually. This is, so again, content warning. This is basically, I'm not gonna spoil the story, but it's basically about a psychedelic experience of sorts. And then I'll, you know, I'll just read it basically. The thousand year stare. We began by eating the mushrooms. Two large ones were before us and we ate them both slowly. At first, it was subtle, a dance in the corner of the retina. As the room began to ebb and flow with energy slowly, she sat on her lap and we talked, energy flowing between us. It was nice, comforting, and I enjoyed being in a pleasurable feminist, feminine presence. Some I had longed for since my breakup last year, a painful experience which had me search of it in one way or another, let me hear to her once more. She asked, do you see me as young or old? I've always seen you as a bit of both, I responded, which is what I had always thought, in all honesty. I may have even called her my muse at one point, as I always felt there was an aspect in our relationship, a reflection or a mirror of sorts. Then we looked at the bricks above on the ceiling as they began to transform in a subtle manner with them in focus. Seeming to represent agricultural scenes and industry. We talked a little about this, and she said, do you see anything? So I described what I saw on the purple bricks. Peasants and workers, industry and agriculture, all vibrating with a spiritual purple glow. A history of man rising from the caves to ascend to his pretensions of godhood. Next, some slight distortion began in my eyes as the bricks warped somewhat like an orb, was warping them spatially. I began to see that the world was nowhere near as stable as ordinary as ordinary consciousness would have us believe. The illusion was crumbling. We went to the bed and I laid on her belly as we, we hugged each other. My head then went downwards towards her pelvis, but it was all playful rather than aggressive. I felt desire for her with an undercurrent of wanting to be healed somehow, some nurse for me, so immature and infantile. But that was how it was. I think it often is for men, if we are honest with ourselves. Oh, some nurse for me. So immature and infantile. Well, that's how it was. I think that's often how it was for men. If we were honest with ourselves. The next thing I remember, we were on her bed as she lay with her back to me. I held her from behind in a big spoon position, with body mass providing a protective shield. I gave her some kisses on the neck and we embraced like this for the duration of the peak of the trip. The rest, as usual, was all a bit of a blur, but as we recall, the drapes began to take on a life of their own as they came to life with the spectrum of light itself pulsating between cosmic forms and something a little sinister like wires and a technological cube surrounding us. Not exactly threatening, but somewhat sinister, her rainbow drapes became like a galaxy viewed from afar, and I saw the light spectrum visually, light itself shifting in and out and scattering waves, breaking down and reforming in my mind's eye. It was a beautiful and profound sight to witness. A timeless eternity unfolded before me and I lost myself utterly in it. Something akin to a profound sort of death of the self. The timelessness of the cosmos and how utterly fantastic it was. I looked down at her face in times and it seemed like she was phasing and out of consciousness or perception. She was holding back some pain in herself and I was taking all, it was taking all her strength to contain it. I shifted in and out of consciousness and witnessed what seemed like wires coming out of her head. Like she was in a sort of technological pod. I was saddened. I felt saddened to see her upset and tried to comfort her. I don't want you to see me like this, I recall her saying with a tone of melancholia lingering on her words. So I retreated a little. 
As I sensed she felt an edge and laid on my back, staring above at the ceiling. My thousand yard stare. I felt distant from her now, and it was a sense of great loss that overtook my senses. I detached from me, from her, from life, returned to that void I inhibited almost too naturally. Absolute connection to the loneliness of existence. Once more, it became the scenes of industry and agriculture on the brick on the ceiling from before in purple, almost like neon Soviet, if I had to call it anything. We began to communicate somehow about the language in the original form of the Russian uh, uh, language. It was all a little blurry and a bit difficult to re recollect, like abstract noise on a TV set late at night. Beautiful static, no doubt, but background ambience and somewhat incoherent. She had an impressive dream catcher art piece containing the form of a tesseract and cube which began to take on a new life. My mind focused on this for a while and I had the feeling we were both observing this like it was some sort of divine object before discussing somehow the push and pull of it and shift it, uh, as it shifted in and out of perception, both as an inspirational object and something to fear deeply. Like a weapon, a new form of nuclear bomb full of creative and destructive potential. Something that could both save us or damn us all to oblivion. I had the thought of, we must learn to use this responsibly, if we were to use it at all. At some point, we said to each other we wanted to save the world and that we'd always wanted to make it a better place. I caught the feeling that we were both wounded souls, hurt by our experience of life struggles as much as inspired by them. Nursing each other's wounded idealism being, of course, a great idea. A perfect way to bond during such an intense psychedelic experience. Next, the mood shifted somewhat, and again, it felt like, for what felt like an eternity, as time lost all real meaning, becoming as it probably truly is, pure subjectivity. I stared at the ceiling, and the ceiling began to feel a little like a sort of hospital bed, a gentle resting spot I would spend my final days in. But it was not menacing, it was somehow comforting, like a psychedelic death. The final blink into the cosmic eye of light, smiling at me in, smiling me at me in a smile of purity beyond words. I looked at her again, she looked sad, and said again, I don't want you to see me this way. She looked somehow older or different, sadness written on her face and tears in her eyes as she said the words. And I had the feelings of wires dancing around us. It felt like we were both lying together in a sort of digital tomb. But it was not entirely unpleasant. A lot of pulsing and neon ambience prevailed, purple and green being the dominant colours. Perhaps our future caretakers in some higher dimension of God AI. Well, the mind boggled. It could just as easily be of luciferic origin. I had the feeling of us both walking through the corridors of each other's mind for the rest of the trip. Which, whilst odd, was also interesting and exploratory. At one point, we both discussed the concept of being the last human beings alive. Uh, the survivors of some great cataclysm staring into each other in totality. Man and woman, devoid of all pretense, staring within and erasing ourselves in the other. Perhaps we, one day we will be the only ones left. Some great disaster having consumed our brothers and sisters. Were that to be the case, as unlikely as it would have to be to pass, I have felt at least a glimmer of hope would remain in for us both. Mummified in our tomb of psychedelic excess. Nailed to our vision. Dreamers in the gloom of purple lights and neon green. So that's that. That's 20 minutes already, isn't it? So that's, yeah, I hope you enjoyed that reading. Um, that's kind of going to be the last ones I read of like one complete one and one like half of, because uh, I might do some process based like sort of things, but I don't want to read obviously the whole book before it's released because that's not really the, the point of uh, making and selling and writing books, <laughs> to put it bluntly. But um, yeah, if you have any thoughts, feedback, please let me know. I always love receiving feedback from people. Um, constructive, of course. I mean, you know, please don't call me nasty things. Uh, well, I'm not going to say please don't. Don't call me nasty things, assholes. Potential assholes. Anyway, that's that. I'll uh, say a bid you adieu. And uh, yeah, give me feedback. It's, it's, always, it's always, I always like that. And I don't have leprosy or anything. It's just something with my hair and that. And, you know, it's a bit spotty at the minute. I want to 
going like a spotty teenager again. It's embarrassing. Though. Anyway, bye.